Hi, and welcome to Managing Human Resource Systems, Chapter 11. Let's get started. This is a big one, and I'll try to keep it under an hour. Uh, learning outcomes, we look at different types of employment laws, uh, companies and how they recruit, uh, the selection techniques and procedures for deciding uh, who should receive job offers, how to determine uh, training, and there we go, uh, using performance appraisals to give meaningful performance feedback, the basic compensation strategies, uh, we'll kind of look at that one rather quickly. Um, and uh, let's get going with the definitions. So HRM is what we're talking about. I know that um, the first day of class when um, I was asking you guys to look at the focus to career, first week of class rather, focus to career, I know several of you uh, showed a lot of interest in human resources. So this is your chapter. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the major, uh, you would be pursuing a Bachelor's of Arts or Bachelor's of Science in Business Administration with an emphasis in uh, management and a sub-emphasis or a focus on human resource management. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's a great and very rewarding career. It's a lot of work, uh, but uh, with the with the right credentials and the right training, also it can be it can be rewarding uh, financially. So HRM is the process of finding, developing, and keeping the right people to form a qualified workforce. Uh, and so if you think about, first of all, just that definition alone, a lot of people tend to think, oh, that's, you know, the people in charge of firing. Well, separation is obviously part of HR, but really the focus is on recruiting and training and developing. Uh, let's look at what HR really does. And so the first thing is, again, to attract employees. You do that through recruiting and selection. And then develop them, training and performance appraisal, and keep them. And then you do the compensation, etc. And, of course, separation. And it could be for several reasons, many reasons we'll talk about. All right, there are a lot of uh, federal laws there. And um, I'm not going to ask you to memorize all of them. Uh, obviously, uh, and by the way, this is a uh, page uh, 227 is where we start here. Uh, obviously, the, the big ones, right, Civil Rights Act of 64 and Civil Acts Right of 91 are the biggies. 91 reinforces 64, uh, and, uh, and this is the, the act that prohibits employment discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, gender, or national origin. Uh, since, you know, obviously I'm not discounting the others, uh, lots of other super important acts there. Uh, FMLA is interesting because FMLA, Family Medical Leave, does not fall under the same uh, guidelines, right? Um, FMLA is interesting. We are the only developed country in the world, the United States. We are the only developed country in the world uh, to not pay uh, our employees to spend time with their children as a law, as a federal law. If you work for a company that paid, that was your company's choice, which, which would be great, by the way. Uh, but it, the law, FMLA, all it does is it protects your job. If you need to take time off to spend time with your new baby, uh, you will not lose your job. And that's all it does. It does not uh, mandate that you should get paid while you're gone to spend time and bond with your baby. So we're, we're, we're way behind, uh, and uh, that, but I thought I would share that with you. The U.S., the only developed country in the world uh, to not have that. Uh, let's see, uh, a new, newer acts, right? 2008 Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Uh, it's, it's still fairly new. Uh, labor laws uh, are laws that regulate the interaction between management and labor unions that represent groups of employees. Pretty straightforward there. Uh, OSHA, I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with OSHA, especially if you work, uh, you know, in some industries that require OSHA. I know in the Inland Empire, many of you work in distribution, warehousing, logistics, etc. And OSHA is a big deal there. Uh, you make sure that nobody gets hurt. Same thing with the restaurant business. Uh, it sets safety and health standards uh, for employers and conducts inspection to determine whether those standards are being made. I have a little clip here. Some of you perhaps remember uh, the documentary uh, Blackfish. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, 
I have a little trailer here uh, that I'll share with you so you could uh, familiarize yourself with it. So as you can see, this was a big deal when it came out. Um, initially, OSHA actually came after the company. Uh, they had a fine of, uh, believe it or not, only $25,000. It's $25,770 is on page 229 of your textbook. Uh, and the, the ruling was that SeaWorld did not have adequate procedures in place to protect employees and supervisors properly from killer whales while riding on or swimming with the animals. Um, and then the solutions would have been fast rising, pools, etc. And so this was a big deal. Um, and as you can see here on this slide, uh, the uh, uh, SeaWorld eventually agreed to pay $65 million to settle a class action lawsuit. And so that's, a, that, that's an extreme example of, uh, in this case, OSHA. And uh, in case you haven't seen the documentary, it came out in 2013 and it was a big deal. And of course, uh, now if you go to SeaWorld, you will see uh, things are being you know, very, very different than they used to be. There's no show anymore involving uh, killer whales. Uh, all right, moving along to disparate treatment. Uh, and so here we, this, we have a disparate treatment as occurring when people... Uh, are not given the same hiring, promotion, or membership um, opportunities. Uh, this is due because of their race, color, sex, age, ethnic group, country of origin, or um, re religious uh, beliefs. And so uh, now you, you want to make sure that you understand the difference between disparate treatment and adverse impact. Uh, disparate treatment is intentional discrimination. Someone here is intentionally discriminating, right? Um, you had an example in your book here on page 230, Bobby Nichols, a former facilities management at Staples, uh, was awarded $26 million uh, when they found a, guilt, a, a jury found uh, Staples guilty of harassing him with all kinds of uh, horrible epitaph. Uh, and so uh, that would be, again, voluntary uh, this is not something that happens, just um, it's intentionally, sorry, it's intentional. Uh, on the other hand, adverse impact is unintentional. And what happens here is uh, when members of a particular uh, race, sex, ethnic group are unintentionally harmed or disadvantaged because they're hired, promoted, or trained at substantially uh, lower rates than others. So how is that determined? Well, there's a four-fifth rule uh, which is a simple calculation, uh, it's a quick ratio, used to determine if there has been a case of adverse impact. So the violation occurs when the impact ratio is less than 80% of four-fifths. Uh, and so it, just think, again, using the example from your author, uh, if the impact ratio is less than 80%, then adverse impact may have occurred. Example, if 20 out of 100 black applicants are hired, that's 20 out of 100, that's 20% but 60 white applicants are hired, 60 out of, a one, uh, out of 100 is 60%, then adverse impact has occurred because the impact ratio is less than 80%. Uh, that's 0.2 over 0.6 at 33%. And so that's the calculation used uh, uh, to make that, uh, that call. And the impact ratio is calculated by dividing the decision ratio of a protected group by the decision ratio of a non-protected group. That's the example I just gave you. Uh, sexual harassment, a uh, form of discrimination in which verbal or physical conduct of sexual nature occurs uh, while performing one's job. Uh, and so here, uh, there are different types, right? Uh, quid pro quo and hostile work environment. Quid pro quo is Latin for something for something else, or this for that. Uh, you've heard of it before. Probably many of you uh, through your work, uh, uh, had to go through uh, some kind of a training on sexual harassment. And so quid pro quo employment outcome depends on whether an individual submits to sexual harassment. Uh, you know, this is, you know, the, you know this, your, some, some uh, boss is uh, basically alluding to the fact that if a subordinate doesn't, you know, go to dinner with him, uh, uh, and, or something kind of a socially not, not done with all the other employees and a little sketchy. And if the person, if the employee declines, then that, that, employee, that employee gets punished, right? Uh, maybe they don't you know, get transferred or even worse, fired, etc. So that's, that's uh, 
quid pro quo. Hostile work environment is unwelcome and demeaning sexually related behavior, uh, creating an intimidating and offensive work environment. Um, and so this, uh, there's lots and lots of examples. If you feel that there's something uh, at work uh, that is unwelcome sexual uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, attention or unwelcome environment of, of a sexual nature, uh, you report it to your HR and you document everything right away. Your company should have pretty sound training and uh, even more importantly, sound reporting, right? There should be a very clear way for people to uh, respond. Hostile work environment. Remember these three words. These are the magic words. If you feel at work like you're not getting attention uh, as you want to complain about someone who's behaving in an in a, in inappropriate manner, uh, this is when you would, uh, you know, remind, let them know, I, I believe that, I, you know, this feels like a very hostile work environment. And often that'll get everybody's attention very quickly. So how do you train? Uh, there's an example that's, uh, this is, a, the company's called CA Technology. You can look, up, look them up. They're a very big company. Uh, but they, they, they won an award for this character they created. Uh, the name of the character is Griffin Peabody. Uh, if you Google him, you'll see him everywhere. Uh, and so this is from the YouTube channel of the company. Uh, again, they won awards for this guy. He's, it's, it'll make you cringe. Uh, but they basically wanted to make sure their employees really, uh, you know, understood. And so they got their attention with this really terrible character called uh, Griffin Peabody. But more importantly, at the end of the videos, they would kind of summarize and explain to employees what the expectations are and, um, you know, how to report, etc. So I'll, I'll show you this clip now. I tell you, I never had a Mai Tai, but it was tasty. Speaking of tasty... That genie is easy on the eyes. You're right, but she's also very good at her job. <laughs> exactly, she's hot. You know, sometimes when I see her, I'll pretend to make photocopies just so I can follow her down the hall. <laughs> hey, genie! Stop staring at me, creep. But well, she's fiery. Hey, Griffin, I think you're making her feel uncomfortable. Oh, no, no, she says stuff like that all the time, like, you're creepy and, and, and you repulse me and get away from me, I have mace. <laughs> I'm gonna go talk to her. Gotta go. Okay. I give an amazing back rub. Rachel. I knew I smelled the sweet cotton candy. Come here, have a seat. No, I'm preparing for our meeting. Preparing? <laughs> you don't need to prepare. All you have to do is show up and look hot. And you got that down. See, so you went with a tight shirt. Nice. You're a team player, Rach. Team hug. No, I'm not giving you a hug. Team hug, you're the only one here. At CA Technologies, we want all employees to feel welcome in the workplace and there is simply no place for behavior that is harassing or otherwise inappropriate. Any harassing behavior directed at someone because of things like their age, race, religion, gender, disability status, or sexual orientation has no place in our business and will not be tolerated. Harassment can take many forms, including things like coarse language, inappropriate jokes or pictures, ethnic, racial, or sexist jokes or slurs, inappropriate touching or banter, inappropriate emails, and in the case of Griffin, actions of a sexual nature that make another employee feel uncomfortable. We encourage you to speak up if you feel you have been the victim of harassment or if you have witnessed the type of inappropriate behavior that was just described. Our local HR business partners are available to help you, so please reach out to them. There you go. So, um, as you can tell, um, this was, um, th this gets everybody's attention. It's, it's, it's goofy. It's, uh, again, uh, that character, you know, will make you cringe a little bit, but it gets the message across. All right, let's now skip to recruiting, uh, how to go about the process of hiring talented applicants. So this is the process of developing a pool of qualified job applicants. The first step is job analysis. This helps create job description and job specification. And so 
imagine some, you know, the position that you have wherever you work, or maybe we're creating a new position. Uh, let's say, you know, for the business department, uh, we, we are actually a, a small department. Uh, we have two faculty members teaching accounting full time. We have two faculty members uh, teaching business law full time. We have one faculty member teaching business full time, yours truly, and that's it. And so let's say that, you know, we decided to hire someone uh, to teach real estate, one of the most uh, popular programs we have. Uh, and we want to hire someone full time to teach real estate instead of having uh, several adjuncts teach real estate. And so we would have to do a job analysis to figure out uh, how to go about creating this position. Uh, we'd uh, have to come up with a job description of, you know, what this person will do. So a uh, written description of the basic tasks, the duties, the responsibilities required for a particular job. Uh, and so, you know, in this case, we're talking about the tasks, you know, would be obviously teaching, uh, but there are other tasks as a professor, uh, researching, uh, curriculum development, uh, uh, student learning outcome development, uh, all kinds of things, you know, uh, ongoing training, et cetera, et cetera, uh, course, program, all that stuff. And then we're getting into job specification. Now that we have the job description, the written summary of the qualifications needed to perform the job. How much, uh, so what degree do we want them to have? Obviously, we want a master's degree. Is it going to be an MBA? Is that the, the, the emphasis? Do they, you know, how long have they have to have been uh, in the real estate industry? Three years, one year? What, what are we thinking? And how much experience in real estate? Uh, a real estate agent, a real estate broker? Uh, do the, we want them to have some kind of a, uh, you know, uh, outside certification above and beyond real estate? You, you get the idea. And so for, for this, I wanted to, to show you uh, what Chafee uh, looks like uh, from our HR standpoint, uh, what Chafee looks like when, when we're hiring. And so this is for someone uh, for the part-time pool, right? These are the uh, adjunct uh, professors who teach part-time. Why, why pull this one? Well, because there are no full-time positions right now, obviously, in the midst of uh, COVID and maybe even uh, not too many for the part-time. And so... If we want to look at, uh, for the part-time pool, for the business department uh, to teach a business classes, such as this class here, uh, what, what are the information? So, uh, you know, first you have the general information, Chafee College is seeking someone, etc. Minimum quals does not guarantee employment. What that means is even if you have the right degree and experience, doesn't mean you're going to get hired. Uh, what are the minimum quals? Well, like I said earlier, master's in business or business management, business administration, Master's in business administration is, is like the gold standard. We call that the MBA, um, accountancy, finance, etc. cetera. Uh, or, notice it says or, so you might think like, really, or? A bachelor's degree in any of the above and. So if you had a bachelor's in business, then you would definitely need something else here. And those other things would be maybe a master's in econ. So in this case, if you have a bachelor's degree, uh, I'm sorry, a master's degree uh, in economics, but your bachelor's was in business administra administration, at least you have the minimum qualifications. Or if you have, you know, uh, an econ with a business emphasis or a JD, which is, you know, a law degree, you get the idea. Uh, there we go. Clear. This is one of the most important aspects of our interview process in minimum quals. And uh, I'm always shocked by sometimes how little attention applicants uh, put into this one. Uh, application procedure, uh, so it tells you, you know, how you go about applying, uh, compensation, additional information. So that's kind of, you know, just to get people in uh, understanding what the job description and uh, not even that much on job specification at that level that comes a little later. Uh, internal recruiting. So now this is the process of developing a pool of qualified job applicants from people who work in the company. Uh, you might you might ask yourself, you know, is that a good thing? Do we want to hire? Do we want to promote people from within, or do we want people from outside the company? Um, well, 
you know, first it depends on, on the company, it depends on what the job is, etc. Maybe there's no expertise internally for the kind of position that you're trying to fill. So that could be something. But as much as you can, as much as you can, always start internally. Why? Well, you know, I can answer that with a very simple question. Have you ever had to train someone for a job that you applied to and were declined, right? So you applied for this promotion and you thought you were going to be the logical choice. You've been here X amount of years. You're really good. Your performance appraisal are fantastic. Evaluation's amazing, everything. But then they decline you, but they tell you uh, there's Bob over here who just started. He's new with the company. Please train him. That stings, right? And think about what are you going to go the extra mile for this company? I mean, this actually probably happened to some of you. I'm, I'm always amazed how companies still make that, that mistake. And so it's a, it's a, internal recruiting is, is very important uh, to make sure that you have the right culture within your company and that you're motivating your employees by letting them know, look, when something is available, we'll always make it available to you first and we'll go out of our way to promote you. That's how you keep people. Uh, Edison, Southern California Edison, is really good at that. I mean, they have an amazing reputation. In fact, they're featured in this textbook many times. Uh, when you study business, especially when you study management, uh, you, will, you will hear about Edison because they, they have some amazing practices. Of course, they're not perfect. Nobody is. So what are the methods here for internal recruiting? Job posting, you advertise job opening within the company to existing employees, and maybe you have a career path, plan sequence of jobs through which employees may advance within an organization. Uh, I have a former student uh, who actually ended up uh, with Edison, and it's been really great to keep up with him over the years uh, and to see exactly that, how every boss he's had at Edison uh, nurtures the growth and the training uh, they actually sent him to Caltech to make sure that he could get certification in operations management uh, for, for, um, for the kind of job they were trying to promote in, into. So, so again, there are different reasons um, for that, and, and that, that's one of them yeah, there. All right, external recruiting. All right, now you got to go outside. So let's, let's look at that. Uh, this is the process of developing a pool of qualified job applicants from outside the company. I used the example of real estate earlier. None of my colleagues, and definitely myself, none of us would qualify to teach real estate full-time. Um, even if a couple of us uh, maybe have the right certifications or uh, the right uh, credentials, uh, we are still not uh, qualified to teach that class full-time. So we would want to reach out externally, right? And so what are the methods? advertising, internet job sites, etc. There's lots of different ways of getting there. Uh, employee referrals. There's some companies who will actually give incentives. If you refer someone and they come in and we hire them, uh, you'll get a bonus. You'll get a something. Uh, you know, usually they'll say that it, when the employee has worked with us for at least six months, then there's your, you know, 200 bucks. Uh, Walk-ins, outside organizations, etc. Uh, special events. I wanted to uh, highlight LinkedIn, right? I wanted to, if you're not on LinkedIn, uh, you're making a catastrophic mistake. Uh, and here's why. Uh, let me give you kind of some specs about LinkedIn. So th these are just some regular, some, you know, some, some, some statistics. There are, well, think about this, which is almost 800 million people on LinkedIn. Just to give you an idea, that's, uh, well, more than twice the U.S. population right there, right? And so that's a lot of people. LinkedIn is international. Um, number of monthly active users, uh, there's 310. From outside the U.S., there's 171 million. I mean, it just is astounding uh, that when you look at the, the statistics and the demographics of LinkedIn, who's on, etc., etc. 
it's the number one uh, social media for digital uh, marketing for, for companies. Um, let's see, when you look at who is on uh, LinkedIn, uh, I mean, look at that, 41% of millionaires, uh, you, you, everybody's on there. If you're not on there, you are really shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, it's it's free. You you can pay if you want like all the bells and whistles, but it's free. Uh, I know I personally uh, refer a lot of students on LinkedIn for various things. Uh, yes, social media. Sorry, that was the one. Social media, LinkedIn, etc. Um, all right, moving along. Uh, selection and validation. So uh, let's talk about the selection process itself. Uh, process of gathering information about the job applicants to decide who should be offered the job. The validation process of determining how well a selection test or a procedure predicts future job performance. The test is said to be more valid when the prediction of future job performance is better or more accurate, right? So this is where, uh, you know, you're an airline and you're hiring a pilot and yeah, you're going to put them in a, some kind of a simulation environment uh, to see uh, how well they perform. Uh, all right, what are the procedures? So application forms and resumes. Companies collect uh, information uh, on, on their, of, uh, in their own format and entry into their HRS, HRIS. So, so their own format, a lot of times, you just enter the, you know, whatever information within the fields. Uh, employment references. Um, as sources, previous employers. Don't, by the way, don't lie. Don't lie. People get busted all the time. It is insane. We actually had someone teach a class and after a few weeks, um, HR called us. They found something out after the fact, even though they passed a you know, full background check uh, that showed that there was um, a little gap there that was erroneous. And that, that, that was it. That day they were you know, told you're done. And so it's just not worth it. Uh, background checks, here we go, we just talked about that. Interviews, there's different types of interviews, structured or unstructured interviews. Um, structured interviews are the recommended ones. I mean, depending on what the job is, but uh, you want to make sure that everything is equitable, everything is fair. Best way to do that, uh, you and your committee come up with, I don't know, 12 questions, and you are going to ask the same 12 questions to all applicants. That keeps everything level. Imagine you have 12 people and you ask different questions. Uh, that might not be fair because maybe accidentally or not, by the way, some people uh, got the harder questions than others, right? All right, let's uh, keep going. Uh, the description, again, so specific abilities and aptitude tests, uh, cognitive ability. Uh, legally, companies cannot uh, give you an IQ test. Uh, and so, you know, it, by the way, some companies disguise them. Uh, numerical aptitude, general reasoning, spatial aptitude, again, depending what kind of the job, what, what, what the job is. Uh, bio data, uh, extensive surveys, asking experience about personal background, life experience, personality tests. You might be wondering like, what? Personality test? Yes, absolutely. And it's not asking like what your favorite color is, but it's going to ask you a lot of questions. And the company might actually determine based on your answers, when they hire you, uh, what team to put you in, right? Uh, and and it, it makes a lot of sense, right? For those of you from, I mean, go back to um, uh, the, the, the test that you took the first uh, semester, I'm sorry, the first week here at Chafee in my class, uh, the focus to career, uh, the outcome, the results of that test would be very useful to an employer who wants to put you in a nice, uh, group uh, with a mix of participant so that you can really, uh, you know, shine uh, and be highly, highly productive. Work sample tests. Uh, this is also, I mean, just think about an artist, you know, somebody who's an artist, uh, they'll bring in their sketches or whatever. Assessment centers, uh, you know, this is uh, simulations, etc. All right. What topics to, invo to avoid? You know, do you have any kids? How old are you? I mean, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, have you had lawsuits, uh, you know, citizenship? And, um, you know, I have this clip that I want to share with you about name. Uh, and uh, because it's a, it's a very real issue. And so this is, um, this is something that some of you might be familiar with. 
Uh, but let's see what you think, uh, if, you've, if you can relate to that. Jose Zamora, and I had to drop a letter to get the title. Every morning I wake up, go on Craigslist, and apply to as many jobs, every job I can, that I feel qualified for. About 50 to 100 a day for months. No phone calls, no, no emails, nothing. One day I just thought, what if I try Joe? Just remove the S in my name and maybe I can make some dollars. On it. The Monday I decided to go from Jose to Joe, seven days later, the next Monday, that's when all the responses started coming. That's when all the replies and the emails. The position is open, we want to meet with you. Um, call us back. I was applying for the same exact jobs, the exact same resume, the exact same experience, just the different name. Sometimes I don't even think people know or conscious or aware that they're judging, even if it's by a name, but I think we all do it all the time. So um, sobering again, some of you uh, might already know about this. You might be familiar with this. Um, I, I, about oh, 10 years ago, a, a former student of mine uh, who was phenomenal, a great student um, all around, uh, even outside of the classroom, very engaged uh, in a lot of things. His name was Jesus. And uh, he actually did this. He, um, he decided to experiment and uh, changed his name to Joe online and applied to the same company. And it was really shocking and very sobering and very upsetting because the companies that had turned him down as, as Jesus uh, uh, took him in, interviewed him as, as Joe. So again, it is, you know, still there, you know it. Um, training, let's get into training. The needs assessment is conducted prior to training. So you identify and prioritize the learning needs of your employees. You wanna see how much they know so you can bring them up to speed. What's the criteria? Number of people to be trained, what's the cost, and uh, you know, it can be evaluated, evaluated based on uh, reactions, learning behavior, uh, results, you know, et cetera. And so let's look at training objectives and methods. Uh, you have, uh, what's the objective? Well, if the objective is to impart information and knowledge, these three here are the training methods. If it's to develop uh, analytical problem solving skills, then you're looking at case studies, coaching, etc. If it's uh, to practice, to learn, change, job, behavior, uh, these are going to be the ways. And uh, to impart information and knowledge, uh, develop analytical problem solving skills, etc. Then we're talking about computer-based learning. Performance appraisal. So this is assessing how well employees are doing their job. Let me ask you this. Let's pretend you're across the table from me and I'm giving you a performance review and I'm what I'm telling you sounds something like that. Um, you did meet your objective. Uh, your your uh, your goals are way off. Uh, you are uh, not being effective in you know uh, your outcome, your output, etc., etc., etc. When you hear those those three descriptors that start with you, 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 you. Uh, it's, it's very, it's almost impossible, humanly po impossible, to not feel defensive, right? You, you automatically think, oh, God, I'm, I feel like I'm under attack. Um, you know, good performance appraisals, by the way, this is not in the book. Uh, good performance appraisal, you something called, first of all, the sandwich approach. I'm sure some of you have heard about that. You always start with the good news, right? And by the way, when you start, when you do the good news is when you use you. So you are doing an astounding job. Uh, you brought us this, you know, this uh, contract here from company XYZ and uh, really helped the company, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you start with the positive and the positive is in the second person. And then you sandwich the negative in the middle. But here's the really important part. The negative is delivered using the third person, not the second, but the third person. So you're not using you, you're using it. The report that was submitted last month was off. The total was off. There were issues with the report. And so now it's more like you and I are trying to find out how we can do this the right way in the future. We're just trying to solve a puzzle here. And so just think about how important it is when you communicate in that manner 
during your performance appraisals. So making administrative uh, decisions, providing feedback, evaluate HR programs, document performance rating and decisions, all of that is going to be part of uh, your performance appraisal. Moving along uh, with the rating error. So, you know, again, we call it human error for a reason. You're with right, human, right? So rating error is a center, central tendency error. All workers are rated as average or in the middle of the road. Nobody's great, nobody's bad, you're all C's, right? Uh, I'm sure you've had professors like that. Uh, halo error. All workers are rated as performing at the same level. They're all good, or they're all bad, or they're all average in all parts of their jobs. And the leniency error, they're rated as performing particularly well. So you have to train your raters on how to make sure they rate well. Uh, what are the objective performance measures? So they're easily and directly counted or quantified. Uh, when not available, then you can go into subjective measures. Uh, graphic rating scales, behavior, observation scales, uh, etc. Um, the uh, rater training, I just talked about that a little bit, uh, is a performance appraisal. Uh, raters are trained in how to avoid rating errors and so that uh, they can increase their rating agencies. All right, so now uh, there we go. So your book on uh, Sorry. Your book on page 247 uh, will give you on exhibit 11.9 that subjective performance appraisal scale, right? What is subjective performance appraisal? appraisal? So again, uh, on the behavioral scale, it could be, are you greeting customers and smiling hello? Uh, promptly handling customer concerns, things like that. All right, how uh, and what to discuss in a performance appraisal feedback session. Uh, again, uh, don't say, what are we stuck on? Instead, what are we doing really well? Uh, nice work, uh, you showed great promise with. So anyway, you get the idea. Uh, compensation, uh, you know, again, very, very important part. There's a zillion different ways of doing this. And you'll learn more about this uh, when you transfer anyway. So I usually kind of brush up over this. Uh, if, you know, I, I remind students that it's really important for you to do the math before you get the position and always, always, always try to factor in how many hours uh, you will be not just working, but how many hours you'll be away from home. You know, uh, is this a position that requires a lot of uh, travel, a lot of flying? I mean, you know, when you're in a plane for hours, uh, you, you know, are you getting paid for this? And, um, you know, how do you measure even quality of life, right? And so there's lots and lots of ways of looking at compensation. Uh, so the pay structures are set using job evaluation. The job evaluation determines the worth of each job in a company. I have, I have a, a, a big secret reveal for you. Are you ready for this? If the job is easy, it won't pay well, right? If it's easy, if the job does not require a high level of practice, training, education, it won't pay well. Uh, and so, you know, just keep that in mind as you're going through your education and stick with it, right? Your degree is going to pay dividends. There's a lot of stuff out there on social media about why degrees are useless and worthless. Well, um, just follow the statistics, right? And don't become a statistics statistic. Uh, so determine the market value of knowledge, skills, and requirements needed to perform a job, right? Uh, so there is going to be the pay level, pay variability, and pay structure. And I'm going to let you guys read that uh, on your own. In terms of pay variability, there's different ways. Of course, you're familiar with, uh, with commission. Uh, profit sharing is not very common anymore. Stock option is pretty much dead. Used to be very popular. Uh, but anyway, just, you know, definition-based stuff, just let you guys do it on your own. Uh, same here. Uh, in terms of employee separation, so there's voluntary or involuntary loss of an employee, right? Uh, termination should be for good reasons. You don't just like fire people willy-nilly. Think about how stupid it is to fire someone for no reason or just because, I don't know, you don't like the attitude or maybe they have personal issues, right? And so, first of all, there's no such thing as personal issues. We're, 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 again, we're, we're human beings, we're not machines. 
And so smart companies make sure that they have programs, anything, could be drug use, could be alcoholism, could be anything. Smart companies take care of the employees and they're there for the long term. And when they help them, especially if they have good health plans, etc., and when they help them get through these phases, I mean, think about the loyalty you get for life. Um, and so it's something to consider. Plus, if you have someone and you spend three years to train them, let's say five years, ten years, right, and you let them go, uh, just kind of think about that way. Think about how much money you invested in training them, in building them, in having them know the industry and the customers. And now, where are they going to go? Well, they don't want their kids to go to a different school, different town. So they're literally going to your closest competitor. Congratulations. You have just trained someone who knows all of your strengths and weaknesses. And now they're going to the other side to help them uh, beat you. It's just not a good call. Wrongful discharge, uh, legal doctrine that requires employers to have a job-related reason to terminate employees. Uh, downsizing, planned elimination of jobs in a company, obviously in the midst of a pandemic, that's been what we've been dealing with a lot. And outplacement service should be used to provide employment counseling for students who have been let go. Uh, some companies maybe, uh, you know, they realize that they, they have to let you go because uh, they have to close up a division or something. But a lot of smart companies are going to let you know that, wait, hold on, next week we have a, a, a job fair. We want you to go and you get priority over any outsiders uh, and we could use you in other divisions of the company. Uh, so the retirement, uh, early retirement incentive programs, uh, actually, um, I, I believe that Chafee uh, College is looking into that now uh, with a lot of uh, employees who are not, were not ready for retirement, but they want to incentivize them uh, to retire a little bit early by maybe uh, kind of relaxing some of the rules about having to wait until 62 years old to retire, etc. Why? Uh, because again, uh, you know, the budget from the state of California has been affected by the pandemic and uh, the economic shortfall. And so that money is not going to the Cal States, to the UCs, to the community college, etc. Less revenue, less to work with. We need to kind of trim the fat. And so, you know, yes, I could keep a faculty member here for an extra two years as they get closer to retirement. That's going to cost me $130,000 a year. Or I could say to them, okay, listen, you're two years from retirement. How about this? If you retire right now, I'll give you 80 grand, you know, and, and then you retire now. So there we go. I, I save money if I do that. So a lot of companies do that. You've heard of it, the golden handshake, the golden parachute, etc. Offer financial benefits to employees to encourage them to retire early. I know Chafee College did that during the last recession. There's phased retirement. Employees transition to retirement by working reduced hours over a period of time before completely retiring. That's actually brilliant. You probably all know someone who's been miserable right after they retired. You know, in the United States, we suck at retiring. We're horrible at it because we associate so much of who we are with what we do. You go to a party, you meet someone, you know, you're mingling. Hey, how you doing? That's the first question. Second, okay, what's your name? Second question. Third question, what do you do, right? I mean, just think about it. It's ingrained in our culture. What we do is part of who we are. And so um, it's a big deal. A lot of people go through depression when they retire. Um, let's see, employee separation. Uh, again, it could be due to employee turnover. It could be a functional turnover, loss of poor performing employees. Uh, very famously, General Electric in the days had a program called the 207010. 207010. The top 20% of the employees worldwide at General Electric, they got bonuses, they got praises, you know, all the special stuff. The 70% just beneath them, congratulations, you keep your job. But the bottom 10%, listen to this, every single year, General Electric would fire the bottom 10% of General Electric, uh, their poor, for, poor uh, performing employees. 
The dysfunctional uh, turnover is when you lose high-performing employees, and it could be for various reasons. Uh, they're dis dissatisfied. Uh, the culture of your company sucks. Uh, you know, they got uh, recruited by your competitors, etc. Well, that does it for us. Um, I hope that you got a lot out of this uh, chapter. Uh, and uh, we are under an hour. We're at 48 minutes, so mission accomplished. And I'll see you guys for the next chapter.